All right. Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you are. I am Monica. I've got Krista here as well. And we are the co-founders of Fearless Public Speaking. And we wanted to hop in today to talk to you about how not to be boring as fuck when you're talking to people. And, you know, we, we went back and forth on what we wanted to call this because we're like, well, we want to focus on presenting. But we decided that overall encompassing what we're hearing is a lot of people have a fear of being boring. And that has to do with not just when you're speaking, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about that too, but it also has to do with when you're just in conversation because we all have such short attention spans today. Human attention span is shorter than that of a goldfish. I think goldfish is like eight seconds and human is seven. I always get that wrong, but it's somewhere in that realm. <laughs> so really, who are we? Uh, Krista, you want to just talk about who you are? Yeah, so I'm a life coach and business mentor and also co-founder of Fearless Public Speaking. And I really focus on the business side of our business or, yeah, the business side of things. So helping people to, you know, get their online businesses built and growing. And Monica, tell us what you do. Yeah, so I am a real talk and public speaking coach. And what I do is really, I like to focus on helping women in particular or anyone who identifies as women and, you know, some men with reclaiming the voice that they've lost or given away to the world by whatever means so that they can say the say whatever the hell they want in a way that feels good for them. And I especially like talking about conversations when it comes to difficult conversations or keeping people engaged um, through virtual, you know, means or in person, like either way, that's kind of my jam. So generally speaking, in the past, we've talked a lot about like creating programs and the setup and the marketing and the logistics. And we know that that part can be challenging enough. Um, but what we want to talk about today, because we do focus a lot on on the business side of things, but what we wanted to dig into today was more of like having the conversations and the interactions with people. So what we're going to talk about, some of it <clears throat> can be a little bit more specific to actually being like in a session where you're coaching or you're training or you're facilitating or you're presenting. But a lot of these same skills are good communication skills that apply to your normal conversations as well. So one of the biggest things that we hear from people, and again, this applies to all those situations, is like, what if people think I'm boring? What if Krista, you know, and I were just talking about this, like, what if people get distracted and they're on their phones or they're like, I'm trying to tell them something important and they're, you know, checking their phone or they're like moving on to the next thing or they're yawning or whatever that looks like. And we want to make sure that, you know, you understand there's an element of realisticness that we have to balance ourselves with. And then also there's the element of how do I be more engaging? Krista, did you want to add anything into that? No, oh, I'm really excited for this topic today because uh, I have some of my own pain points around this personally and professionally. Professionally, I remember when I was going through training to become a labor and delivery nurse and we had to do a presentation to our class and I did it on epidurals and, you know, I spent weeks on it in my head. I'm like, oh my gosh, this information is so cool and everyone's gonna love it and get so much out of it. And I had all these PowerPoint slides and then I started the presentation and it ended up being so much longer. I was thinking it was gonna be like 15 minutes or less and it'll be like 30 minutes and people I could tell were just distracted and they were not excited and they were, yeah, they were like on their phones and it was just, like a punch to the gut of like, oh my gosh, I didn't prepare for this. I didn't realize how boring I was. Um, and then also too, I notice a lot of times, yeah, like when I'll talk with people personally, one-to-one, -one, a lot of times their attention like will start to drift and it just doesn't feel very good. And it kind of makes me feel like, what am I doing wrong? Am I not being exciting enough? Or um, am I not a good conversationalist? And so I think like, this is really important what we're addressing and talking about today personally and professionally. So that way you can not feel like you're boring because it doesn't feel good to feel like you're boring and you're losing people's attention. 
Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> no, thanks for sharing all that, Krista. And, you know, my background comes from the corporate setting. I was in a corporate job for 13 years and seven of those I was in training in human resources. And uh, part of that was doing like call center training as well. And I'll tell you the nitty gritty stuff like 401ks, it was financial services, all of the retirement plans and stuff is not that exciting. And so it really was part of my job to make things more interesting. And when you have a training session, things can look a little bit different than a conversation. But what my style has become over the years and what always resonated with me was more of a facilitative training style. And that's also in conversation which many of you who are coaches out there may recognize this brings in a lot of your coaching skills because it's less about lecture and it's more about experience and interaction, which ends up resulting in more engagement. So let me talk to you a little bit about what that can look like and, and we'll hit both sides of the coin, like from a human to human perspective, and then also from a training or facilitating or presenting perspective. One of the first things is to ask for what you need. Okay. And this is Krista, this just came up for me, like when what you were talking about with when you talk to people, a lot of times people we interact with other people, you know, just the way we would normally interact in life. And so if we've got something on our mind, we're looking at our phone, we got something else to do, we're like, I can pay attention, we multitask, which by the way, multitasking is bullshit. You can't you can multitask, it is possible, but you cannot fully devote your attention to two separate things or 10 million separate things at the same time. You will lose your quality. That is proven fact. Go out there and research it if you want to pull in details on it. Um, but when it comes to conversations, you know, and Krista and I, we're learning this as we work in our business together, too, is it, it becomes about asking for what you need. So if I, if, well, I'm going to use this. If Krista comes to me with an idea, because she does, and she has great ideas, and she doesn't want me, because my brain will usually go to like, well, I'm going to be like, what about this? What about this? What about this? And that to her can feel really shitty, because it can feel like, well, you're shooting down all my ideas, and I just, I don't even want to talk to you about it anymore. So for Krista, it could look like her saying, you know what, I've got this idea. I just need you to listen and hear me out. We don't have to do something about it right now, but like, I just need someone to get excited about this right now, then she is preparing me for how to interact with her. Or if I come to her with like all the nitty gritty details and I know she's going to be like, shit, I don't want to sit in that. I can be like, you know what? I just need you to hear what I'm saying here and just understand that I need to get this out of my head. I don't need you to like actually do anything. And she can be like, okay, cool. I'm just listening. What do you have to add to all of that, Krista? I like that. You're telling people right from the start of how to interact with you and what you need. Now, would you say, Monica, I mean, do you have to do this in like every single type of conversation? Like what about your your husband or boyfriend or something like that? Like, <laughs> are you going to, you know, are you going to start off every conversation with, with that format or what would you recommend for my maybe more like a little bit more casual conversation? You know, it, and so it comes with experience too, right? Because how we develop our relationships with people is we try things out and we see how it works. So maybe if you're having a conversation, um, okay, I'll use my boyfriend because this has come up recently. My boyfriend is like Krista. He has very big ideas and he wants to talk through all of them and, and get, you know, just like ideate. My brain, this drives me crazy. So what I would do if he's like, well, what about this idea? I would be like, well, then we have to do this, this, and this. And he would get like, well, what the hell? Like, I just wanted to talk about the ideas. I don't want to go to the execution. And so we did have to come to a point of being like, okay, generally speaking, if you want to shoot around ideas, I may not be the right person to talk to, or you may have to tell me that this is what you want to do. And I will do my part and try to remember that that's what you need or ask questions. And that's another thing that you can do too, is ask questions about like, are you needing, what are, what are you needing from me right now? So it's not going to necessarily be every conversation, especially to start out with when you first meet someone, you don't want to be like, okay, so what do I need from you today? And my conversation is, you know, you, you just start with the conversation, you kind of see how it goes. But then when it gets to this point where you're like, okay, you know, I feel like they're not, um, really paying attention, uh, asking for what you need is great. And it works really well in training sessions too. I actually uh, did learn this from my old boss 
he, it was so interesting. I didn't believe him at first. He was like, okay, if you go into a training room, what I would do normally is be like, okay, I want you to do this. And people would just be like, oh, they're still talking. They're doing whatever they're doing. And he was like, try this out and go in the middle of the room and just stand there and be like, all right, I need your help with something. And I was like, no, this is not going to do anything. I stood in the middle of that room. I just stood there for a minute and I was like, all right, I need all of you to give me your attention. And I swear to God, the room was like, what? You need something from me. Well, I want to give it to you. That word need is really interesting what it does like to the human brain. So um, it just has a stronger connotation than the word want is like a suggestion. Need is like a, I don't want to say a demand, but it's more forceful. Hmm. I like that. Yeah. You know, that's interesting. You said that because when I was training to become a coach trainer and I was watching my mentor and how she would interact with us when she would lead us and, you know, virtually and, and she would say, OK, I need you to write this down right now. And I had never seen anyone do that before. And I noticed like we all would pay attention mm -hmm. and we all start writing things down. So you're right. It's like it's so simple, but it's so powerful at the end of the day. And I like changing the verbiage from want to need. Yeah, it's little brain tricks. I used to tell my call center reps when I would train call center. Um, I tell them, you know what, guys, you're all master manipulators. Like, let's just be real for a second. It's It sounds really shitty to say that, but communication is manipulation in some ways. It can be positive manipulation, but the word manipulation has a bad rap. It really just means molding something to where you want it to go. And yes, it can be used in a negative way, but, you know, like if you need someone to meander in a certain direction in a call, you're just manipulating the conversation by using different kinds of techniques and different words to bring people to that. So I, I always uh, got a little laugh out of them by telling them like, you're, you're just manipulating. It's, it really is what it is, positive manipulation. Yeah, love that. So is there anything else like, you know, in personal conversations that you wanted to cover or are we ready to switch over to more of like professional and presenting? Um, so, you know, some of it goes along with both personal questions as well is make it a conversation and check in. And I know I've talked about this before. It has to do with difficult conversations, but it really applies to any kind of conversations, which is we often go into conversations wanting to be heard. We think about our own perspective. We're like, this is my need. This is how I want to be heard. But we don't invite someone into the conversation. So we just say, like, this is what it is. And and that's that. And then we let them figure out how they respond. But inviting someone into conversation with us, you know, often includes even in positive conversation, just asking, like, you know, what are your thoughts on that? And this is something we do in coaching a lot is ask for people's input, whether it's feedback or whether it's just like, you know, I don't know, what are you hearing in what I just said? It's a good way to check in and see if people are paying attention to if you see them distracted and you're like, you know, I don't know, these thoughts are a little like jumbled in my head. What are you hearing in what I just said? And that does two things. Number one, it brings them back to the present because if they weren't paying attention, they're like, oh shit, uh, I'm so sorry. Can you repeat what you said? Cool. Second thing that happens is they gonna pay attention the second time you say it because you just brought them back in. Using people's names is another one. Um, you know, it's one you use with caution on how often you do it or you that that's where salespeople like get a bad rap for having quotas on how many times they have to use someone's name on a call. You know, when you're on a call and they're like, Miss Hutchinson, blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, stop saying my name. But really using people's names, especially when you notice their attention waning and being like, you know, Krista, I was just talking to this person the other day. And as soon as you hear your name, it's like a to your brain. It brings you back in. So um, those are things that work both in the personal setting and within any other setting, really. That's true. And actually, I'm glad you brought that in with the coaching conversation, too, because that is an important question to ask when you're coaching someone. And if you end up giving advice, which we we are we need to do sparingly in a coaching call because it's not about giving advice. But when we do, we can bring the conversation back to the person and say, yeah, tell me what you're hearing for yourself and what I just said. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so yeah, that's a great way to implement learning and to redirect that conversation back into like, like you said, inviting them to be part of it. And you're not just lecturing and talking. Yeah. And along with that, the biggest thing, I think the biggest takeaway is that we often project our own security insecurities on other people. Okay. We think we're boring. We think they're on their phone because they're bored. We think that they're yawning because they're falling asleep. Nine out of 10 times, my favorite phrase, it's not about me, it's not about me, it's not about me, okay? They may have a sick kid. They're checking on their phone to see, like, did I get a notification from the school, you know, when schools are open? Or they may have, let's go with right now, it's COVID-19. Maybe your mom just tested positive for it and I gotta actually go look at something even while I'm in an online session. Or maybe I didn't get sleep last night because I got a brand new baby like Chris is going to soon. And good God, I was up every hour of the night. So we we get really selfish with ourselves and we get really caught up in our own shit. And most of the time it is not about us. And so that's where we've got to keep telling ourselves it's not about me. It's not about me. It's not about me. And the bottom line is it comes down to connecting with just one person. So instead of looking for all the people who aren't paying attention, it, it, especially in bigger contexts, you know, one person is a little different, but in broader conversation, it's like, look for the one person who's paying attention, connect with them because they're going to draw other people in with their energy. If you're interacting with them, it's going to draw other people in too. One-to-one -one conversation. <laughs> I'm an advocate for calling a duck a duck too, and being like, Hey, you seem a little distracted right now. Do you want to talk later? <laughs> because it either allows them an out or it brings them back. And it's all about redirection, right? Like pattern disruption. If I'm caught up in the stuff with my kid, but you call out that I'm not focused, it gives me an opportunity to one, leave, or two, to redirect my attention. Yeah, there's a couple of things, three things that you brought up that I wanted to add to that. Um, first is that, yeah, people's entire lives are on their phones now. And for me, like, I love taking notes on my phone, right? On the notepad app on the iPhone. And so- I've gotten checked on that so many times when I thought <laughs> someone was distracted. <laughs> yeah, and I get, I get really like concerned that I'm like, oh my gosh, people are gonna think I'm not paying attention, but I am like, I'm at, this is how I take notes and I like to keep everything in one place. So I love that you did bring that concept up, is it right? It, don't take it personally. It doesn't always, your brain wants to go to like, oh my gosh, I'm so boring, but it really could be that something else is going on or yeah, they're just taking notes. So I love that you said that, Monica. Um, also, I remember you teaching me that when you were my public speaking coach back in the day and I was just joined Toastmasters and you said, you know, don't focus on the people in the room who aren't paying attention or, or distracted, like focus on the people who are engaged. And it's it made so much sense. And that was so helpful and so useful for me when I was giving speeches in person. So I love, love that. And then, yeah, the last thing you said, too, is like lovingly calling people out, doing that pattern disruptor. I've done that a lot now with people. I It's something I wouldn't have done back in the day when I had the guts to do it. But now that I feel more empowered and like a powerful communicator and leader and coach, if if I see someone that's not paying attention, like I'll say something or or yeah, just say something like, yeah, you know, hey, is everything OK? You seem like your attention is elsewhere. And it's. It, it's not coming off as like mean or bitchy. Like it's just, you know, kind of doing like a check in saying, is everything okay? Like, I want you to be a part of this conversation with me. And I noticed that like, that's not happening right now. And um, so, yeah, that's a really powerful thing to do. You know, I had, um, when I first became a manager in a call center uh, was in my corporate career. So it's like, eight or 10 years ago, almost. And I remember I went in as a new manager, just like anyone does. And like someone messed up on some work that they did. And I was just ready to be like, what the hell? Wow, you messed this up. And my manager was great. She went in with me to this session. We brought like, you know, the, the documentation of everything that the person hadn't been doing right. And she asked, she was like, hey, we've noticed some errors in these tickets lately. You know, is everything okay? What's going on? And I was like, you can do that? Like, 
holy shit, you know, I, I would have never thought to do that. And I think a lot of people don't think of that. Don't think of putting the shoe on the other foot. Like, how would you want someone to call you out? And it opened up this great conversation of like, yeah, I've got some stuff in my personal life. And then it becomes like, okay, how we, how can we support you in making sure that this doesn't interfere with your work, you know, to a reasonable degree, of course, but that was my first experience with someone really like asking a good question and noticing what was going on. And we all kind of hide, you know, underneath the surface incognito a little bit, like hoping no one catches us, but like secretly, I feel like hopefully, or that we hope people do catch us a little bit because as soon as they do, it's like, Oh man, I can't just check out of this conversation. Okay. I have to be in the game or I need to tell them that I'm not in the game. And there's a lot of power for yourself when you interact with someone that way, you you set the expectation that like when we talk, I expect you to be present. And it may rub people the wrong way to start with, but longer term, it builds a really strong relationship. Mm-hmm. I started actually doing this too in my coaching relationships with my clients in the past when I would have clients come on and they were really distracted and they had all these things going on in the background and they're having conversations with everyone. I would just try to suffer through it. And it, it was a terrible session, right? Because like you just said, we literally cannot multitask. And now within the first 10 to 15 minutes, if I notice this is going on, I'll just be like, Hey, listen, like, I don't think, it doesn't seem like now is a good time. I really, you know, you paid for this session. I want you to get as much as you can out of this session. Are you open to rescheduling? And yeah. and then and then one of two things will happen. They'll either say, yeah, you're right. You know, like just it, it's not a good time right now. Or they're like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I didn't even yeah. realize I wasn't paying attention and focusing. But it's, it's again, it's coming from a place of like respecting each other and really wanting the client to get the most out of the session at the end of the day. And they can't do it if they're just like, Ooh, and all these things are going on. So, yeah. Did you yeah. have anything else to add on any of those? I know you had said three things. I think I stepped in on number no, two. No, <laughs> no. no. All right. we'll so, Bottom line too, you know, I know our topic today is how to not be boring as fuck while you're talking is that you're not boring as fuck. I mean, bottom line is you think you are, but you're really not. And most of the time when you think you are, it's not about you. It's about somebody else and what's going on in their world. And, you know, it's just about having those conversations to bring them in. Now, when it comes to facilitating and training, um, especially right now with being in the virtual space, it can feel a little bit more overwhelming because Sometimes you can't see people. You might do Zoom sessions where you can see everybody, but people might turn off their video cameras or you don't know how many tabs they have open that they're multitasking with. And it is really hard uh, to keep people, you know, in the game or to keep your brain in check more than anything. So a couple things that you can do in those settings, um, and this can work in live settings as well, is ask people questions. And I do this when when I do my speeches, I I don't ever just lecture or just like talk at people. I'm going to ask questions and they could be open ended questions. They could be rhetorical questions. They could be a raise your hand. I know Chris and I have both used that a lot and it gets people again engaged like, oh, you're asking me to do something. Raise your hand and you know tell me if you've done this certain thing or have you ever been to Florida or whatever it is. And in a virtual setting, you can have people either type that in a chat, you can have them physically raise their hand if you have vis- uh, like visibility of them on the screen. You can also do things like polls as far as saying like, give me an A if you want to break at the top of the hour or give me a B if you want to take a break five minutes after that, something like that. So you can play with it and actually direct people to the chat or to answer a question. And this goes back to the whole thing of like, I need you to do something. You're telling people what to do. You're reminding them where to go. You're directing their attention to something. You're giving them something physical to do. And that way, you know, it's not going to work for everyone. You're still going to have people who are multitasking, totally missed it and didn't do anything. But um, then you direct a lot of people back in and they pay closer attention. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, and I love to give examples, like, so so some really great questions you can ask right off from the beginning is like, 
hey, everyone, tell me what part of the world you're tuning in from or tell me, you know, for I, I lead the Build Your Life Coaching Biz Facebook groups. So I'll say, OK, tell me what kind of coach you are. Or tell me what type of niche that you have and getting people love to be involved in that way. And they get so excited to type in the chat. And again, like it's that back and forth interaction. It's not like a, a college lecture or classroom. Right. And so, yeah, I definitely think that's the best way is like asking yourself the question is how can I get my audience involved as much as possible? Um, another thing that I've seen a lot of great coaches do will set, they'll say something and then they'll be like, if you agree with me, type yes in all caps in the comments, right? Just so it, it's kind of like a little bit like a church sermon, like who's with Amen. Yeah, amen. <laughs> and yeah. you know, like the more you can get people amped and excited and then they're just going to get so much more out of what you're saying. And it works in Facebook lives too. That's I, I hear a lot of coaches when they do Facebook lives be like, give me a high five emoji if you're in or like throw me some hearts or whatever. So you can keep people engaged in your Facebook lives too, or like drop in the chat, tell me this certain thing or whatever. The reason I want to also kind of go back to why I am such an advocate for like facilitative learning is um, if you don't know, basic uh, three types of learning that people have, or for the most part, what most people use are auditory learning, kinesthetic, and um, visual learning. So, you know, some people prefer to really see things, some people prefer to just hear things, and some people prefer to do things. And we, as people who are training or presenting, we tend to teach the way we prefer to learn. So if you're an auditory learner, you won't talk forever, okay? Because that's like, you could listen to things, you could listen to podcasts all day long, okay? If you are a visual learner, you know, maybe you like to draw things on a board to show people what something looks like, or you've got a lot of slides, or you've got videos that you show people. And if you're a kinesthetic learner, you might be like, you know, write that down or do this thing. Um, I was always told, like someone did an assessment of me and they're like, you are equally all three. And I'm like, well, that's why I'm a damn good trainer <laughs> is because, you know, I hear and see where people have these different preferences. But what I'm getting at with this and why I'm telling you this is because when you think about this, you've got to be thinking about the fact that you have all three different types of learners in your audience. So if you just talk at them the whole time, people who are not auditory learners are going to check out. They're they're not listening because that's not how they learn. If you talk at them and you show them something, then you've appealed to your visual learners. If you talk at them, show them something and tell them to do something, then you've hit your kinesthetic learners. So it's a really effective way to bring in all different types of people when you're training or when you're presenting even. This works even if you're in front of a crowd presenting. Yeah, that's interesting that you said that because do you remember I was taking that hypnotherapy training back in Seattle last fall and I, I, I love the woman to death who led the training, but she just sat in front of us and talked for eight hours. And She's an auditory me, learner. <laughs> for me, that is the worst way to learn. Like I literally have, you know, that's why TED Talks are 18 minutes. I think I have 18 to 30 minutes tops of where someone's talking at me and then I just like my brain can't handle it anymore and I remember thinking like why isn't she why would she think this is a good way to teach and train people but I didn't even think that maybe for her she enjoys learning that way so that's why she teaches that way for me personally I don't feel comfortable like if if someone said it's interesting because we've talked about becoming a keynote speaker and a keynote speaker usually presents and can present anywhere from 30 minutes to 60 minutes. And if you told me to get up in front of a classroom and just talk at someone for 60 minutes, like that feels awful. And it makes sense now because like, I wouldn't want to learn like that. Like I'm very much someone like I want to present a new idea and then have it be like a back and forth conversation or, or have people like, get involved and do activities and because yeah, I'm kinesthetic all the way. So it makes sense. That's why I'm so passionate about, you know, teaching in that way and my speeches and my digital courses and workshops and everything. Well, and that's why anymore, you know, the, the old antiquated idea of just lecturing in front of a crowd is so dead. Well, even when it comes to keynote speakers, I mean, most keynote speakers out there, they are doing these things, even if it's just asking the question or getting people involved or being like, turn to your neighbor and 
give them an air five because now we can't touch hands, you know, like what, whatever that is, you can still get people involved virtually and in person. Um, George Carroll, my mentor, and I'm in his transformation Academy group too, but like, you know, his greatest year of your life, he does, he tells a lot of stories, but he also has a lot of activities built in and also like a turn to your neighbor and, you know, say blah, blah, blah. And now when we're, we're, he's converted most of it to virtual settings and he was just like, all right, everybody just say blah, blah, blah. And so you can convert things that you do in person also to a virtual audience in a really simple way. And it still works. Yeah. Another thing too, is I've seen a presenter do dance parties. Uh -huh. So they'll, they'll have built-in breaks. Built-in breaks are great. I know oh, yeah. Monica and I have a uh, online mastermind that's six months long and we, it's two hours every week. And after the first hour, we always do like a five minute bathroom break. And if we wanted to take things to the next level, we could put on some music and have people dance really quickly, which I think is fun is just to get people's bodies moving. But yeah, there's so many different, different things you can do to it's like switch it up and help people to really get the most out of what you're doing and saying. Yeah, definitely. My ex-husband used to say motion creates emotion and it's true. Like that's what we want is for people to move and uh, to get reconnected to what we're talking about. Cause sitting for a long time is, is boring as fuck, right? So um, we want to give them opportunities for movement, whatever that looks like. Okay, so for the sake of time, I'm going to scale through these really fast here. Number two is to give them a worksheet or something they can fill out and follow along with throughout the session. You can do this in person and have it as a handout at your sessions or, um, you know, if people have a piece of paper and you want to direct them to write things down, like Krista was saying, that's really great. Tangible takeaways that you can keep guiding them throughout the call or through a session are really useful. It, again, appeals to those both visual and kinesthetic learners to have something visual Visual and also be able to write on. Mm -hmm. People love worksheets. I oh, anytime I lead a virtual workshop, I always um, design a pretty branded worksheet in Canva and then give it to people to download, and they freaking love it. Yeah, takeaways are good. They feel like free stuff. And then the last one is to let people know up front the format of whatever you're doing. So I think this is really great, especially like if you are going to be asking questions of people, if you're going to be asking them to be engaged. I like to tell people up front, this is going to be interactive. So don't just sit back and expect to listen. And then back to what we talked about like with using people's names i like to use people's names i used to be against this because i felt like it was calling people out but you only have to do it once and that person will be paying attention the whole time <laughs> so um you know you can use it and try it out in different ways but calling people out and asking for different questions it's like being in a college class right like you never know you remember that movie legally blonde where Elle Woods gets called out the first day. She's got her little fluffy pen. Everyone else has their laptops. And she's like, what does this mean? She's like, I didn't know there was an assignment. Your assignment is to be present. So if someone calls calls you and asks you a question, you know, the cool thing is most of the time there's not a wrong answer per se. We're not trying to set them up for failure. But letting people know up front, hey, I'm going to be asking questions, looking for an engagement. I'll be pointing you to the chat box. And Chris and I do this on all of our workshops and our virtual uh, presentations. And letting people know up front, then they know what to expect. Adults want to know what to expect. It is part of adult learning theory. We want to know what's coming. We want to know what it's going to look like so that we don't feel put on the spot later on. Mm, okay, that's good. So, you know, I am taking notes in the background because I am a kinesthetic learner. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's funny. It brought up for me earlier. I learned the hard way because like there are there are some interactive features in different tools like WebEx or Zoom. And if you have a paid tool, you can check it out for more interactivity features like breakout rooms or actual polling or things like that. So you can let me and Krista know if that's something you want to talk more about. I've actually spent a lot of time working in those tools. But the first time that I led an interactive WebEx class, there's this little feature, Zoom has it too, you have to turn it on, that gives you an exclamation point if someone is in a different app or on a different screen than the browser that they're in with you I called somebody out on it and they were like um yeah I was a notepad taking notes and I'm like shit I felt like such an asshole so you know I, I think they're like they're well-meaning but 
like Krista said, people take notes in different places. So it doesn't mean someone's not paying attention. They just might be taking notes on their other computer or like on a different part of the screen. So if that interactivity stuff is something that you're interested in, you know, let me know. I'm happy to talk about those further. And I know Krista's used some of it too. Mm -hmm. So just to recap quick before I have Krista wrap us up. You're not boring as fuck, okay? Let me repeat that. You are not boring as fuck. I know it feels that way sometimes. We all can get in this place of feeling like we are, but it really comes down to setting expectations, asking questions, and you know, setting yourself up for success by asking for what you need within those conversations and like gently redirecting people back in. And that's the same for both your personal conversations and also uh, for any kind of presentations, virtual or in person. Tina says people see the speaker, no matter who it is, like a movie star. And if the movie star calls them by name, it makes them feel special. Names are good. Hell yes, Tina. That's so true. I used to love teaching in my corporate job. I had been there so long. And I taught stuff all over the company and I knew so many people because I had trained new higher orientation or the call center. And I, I pretty much touched everyone in the company. And if I would be in a big session and I'd be like calling on Joe in the corner, he'd be like, oh, she knows who I am, you know. So, yeah, they definitely see the speaker as, as someone fancy, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Krista, wrap us up. Take us away. Okay, well, first of all, thank you everyone for being here and watching this, whether you're live or on the replay, and we so enjoy leading you with becoming a more confident you know, presenter and speaker and leader and all that. So, and also too, we wanna to invite you into our Fearless Public Speaking Academy that starts April 13th. This is the second time we're running it. It's completely online. It's a three month program. And it's for women who wanna become better speakers. They wanna become better presenters. They wanna become more effective communicators, right? We're going, it's basically like Toast, if any of you have ever heard what Toastmasters is, it's like Toastmasters, but for female entrepreneurs. And a little so, edgier. Yeah, and a little edgier. And it really is, we create this really beautiful safe space where you get to start to use your life story in a way that you structure and organize it and you can start to turn it into your signature speech or your next book or your workshop or your, your content or retreat group program but we really realized that there's kind of two different people out there in the world right there's people who are like okay i have an upcoming speech that i'm giving at a funeral or at a wedding and i want to make sure like i i give it well okay that's great i mean we we definitely can help those people but the people that Monica and I really like to focus on are female business owners like ourselves that we realize we've had these big life events happen. And now we want to use this story as a way to attract our ideal client and to build our online audiences and, and, and to hire more people and to make more money and to spread our message. And so there's a little bit more passion with it and and turning your pain into your purpose your mess into your message as we like to say so this is really who the fearless public speaking academy is designed for we have three women currently enrolled i believe we're doing a special um, scholarship option for whoever completes our become a fearless public speaker in five day challenge which we have going on right now so that means we will only have Let's see, what is that? Six, six spots. Spaces. We only have six spaces left open after this. So you're really going to see us start to advertise that hardcore in a couple of days. And if this is something that interests you, if you've been following Monica and I and you like our style, you like our vibe, you want to work with us and become a more confident speaker and, you know, help us to let us help you really figure out what is your stage. Is that like an actual stage or a virtual stage through doing more Facebook lives or leading more workshops or retreats? We oh. want, or, or all of it, you know, or you want to apply to be a TEDx speaker someday. That's my biggest dream. And, you know, we, we want to invite you into this experience with us. So like it says, starts April 13th, we'll drop a link in the comments where you can, register and put your deposit down and find out more information from our website 
and we sold it out in the fall. It was so freaking cool. It's so beautiful to see all these women powerfully sharing their stories for the first time live and talking about really interesting topics. Like one woman had talked about her suicide journey. Um, another woman talked about her infertility journey. Another woman talked about, let's see, what were some of the other topics that they were speaking about? Um, journeys through depression. I think we had one woman who had a medical condition that was, you know, there was a lot of shame behind that, that she had come through and wanted to talk about. Uh, yeah, there, there's just a, such a variety of different things that have come out, things that, you know, feel kind of taboo to talk about, but that have really beautiful lessons that they've learned and channeled into the work that they're doing. Yeah. And basically all these women want to become professional motivational speakers too. So we were just giving them the foundation and the skills to best be able to do that. And then where to start booking speaking gigs too, because you can't just sit back on the couch and expect someone to reach out to you and say, Oh, will you, will you come talk for me? Or will you come speak? Or will you come share about your story? Like you have to go out there into the world and find these opportunities. And so we teach you how to do that. So, and again, as we like to say, speaking opportunities are like business and leadership opportunities, and you're going to find your your soulmate clients, and they're going to connect. They're going to connect with you through your story, and it's going to be so much easier to work with them, and because you share that similar experience. Yeah. So we will drop the link out there, and we'll also we'll drop the link if you want to schedule a call with me and Krista to talk further too. If it's something you're like, oh, I'd like to know more. Um, so you know, we'll put our website link so you can go check out the details of the academy. But then also, if you're just thinking about it, you're not sure, and you want some additional support, like set up a call with me and Krista, and let's chat about it. We want to get to know you and what your goals are, and you know, just understand if this is a journey that we would all like to. Be on together. All right. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. Bye. Bye.